Hey there, what's going on? It's Dr. Mike T. Nelson here, back again with the Flexa Diet podcast. And today I'm doing an Ask Me Anything. So I posted up some questions to Facebook and Instagram, so I'll be covering a few of those here today. If you enjoy this format and want to see more of it, drop me a line. Let me know. Uh, also, drop me a line. Let me know what questions you would like me to answer. Uh, today, brought to you by the Flex Diet Certification. Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com for all the information. If you're looking for a complete system for eight interventions to maximize your ability to recover, and primarily focused on nutrition, <clears throat> the Flex Diet Cert is for you. Uh, it'll probably open again later this year, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, so go to flexdiet.com. That'll put you onto the email list. And we have lots of semi-daily free information for you there. So go to flexdiet.com for all the information. All right. The next question, actually the first question for this episode here. Question, NAD plus and resveratrol as supplements. Highly appraised by Dr. David Sinclair considering longevity and aging, but what is your take on them? Ooh, that's a good question. So thank you to Selena or Cecilia. Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly, if not Please drop me a note and let me know. If we back up a little bit, why would people be interested in different NAD plus uh, supplements? So the main two, there's, well, there's kind of three ways. So three ways you can increase NAD plus, which is an intermediate in the energy pathway uh, processes. I'm not gonna bore the crap out of you with uh, way too much biochemistry. I'll put a bunch of studies here. Uh, one of them's got a really nice uh, overview of it. You can read those for more information. As a supplement in the sports field, there's two main ways. One is NR, the catenamide riboside. The other one is NMN, the catenamide mononucleotide. So via oral consumption of supplements, <clears throat> those are the two main ways that will increase your body's production of NAD or NAD+. Plus. I'll probably just refer to it here as NAD. You can potentially do an IV of NAD+, plus also. Uh, I have not done that. I've heard that it can be quite painful. Uh, it's a little bit more time-consuming. And generally, it's pretty expensive. Um, I've looked around at just... Oop. Somebody's at our door here, I guess. Uh, never mind. Um, but I've looked around at what the cost of an IV would be, and it's several hundred dollars to potentially several thousand dollars. So pretty expensive. There isn't much data on the IV version right now. Uh, I know some people in clinics for TBI or concussions might use it and anecdotally i've had some friends who have done that and uh, they have reported that after several series it was beneficial so anecdotally a lot of the data that's been reported is beneficial again there's you know placebo involved and a bunch of other stuff and there's just not much data that i can find on that so we'll probably set that one aside for now so the two main forms then via supplements, which you can buy over the counter currently, as of this recording, like I mentioned, is NR and NMN. Uh, they both show up in the pathway to increase NAD+. Uh, plus. The data on them is, I would say, relatively split. So I've gone back and forth um, on this. Right now, my bias is more towards NR, or nicotinamide riboside. Reason for that is, as far as I can tell, it has more uh, data, especially in humans. Uh, both of them surprisingly have a fair amount of data. In the sports supplement world, <laughs> you know, shockingly, you don't need a lot of data per se. And the catch-22 in the industry is, 
you can spend money to do a trial, which everyone says, yes, that's what you should do. The downside is, I don't know if it really drives sales. Um, I know of a buddy of mine who ran a supplement company. He doesn't anymore. Uh, they spent a quarter of a million dollars on a study, which was done in humans. And their thought process was, hey, we're doing all the good things. We're running studies. We're showing that this is going to be efficacious. They did show a benefit to it. They didn't really see any uptick in their sales. And you've got other companies that spend absolutely no money on research, maybe even potentially questionable, we'll say, production facilities, testing, etc. But if they've got really good marketing, they can still move a lot of product. Again, this is all ethics aside. So that's kind of the catch-22 in the sports supplement realm. Uh, NR itself is a raw material you can get from Chromadex, which is a large company. And to their credit, they have sponsored a lot of studies on NR. Uh, there are other studies on NMN. From what I've heard anecdotally from my friends in the supplement world is the raw material of NMN appears to be a lot more suspect. Uh, just people who have done off-the-shelf testing. Again, this is unpublished uh, data. And because NMN is becoming more popular now, the raw material itself is still relatively expensive. That generally has an incentive, unfortunately, in the wrong direction for some companies to say, hey, this is NMN and we just stuck it in a bottle and who's going to know, unfortunately. Now, again, that's not technically legal either. According to the FDA, what you put on the label has to obviously be in the bottle. But some companies just bank on the fact that they're not going to get tested and not going to get caught. So again, as always, buyer beware, do your research, do your homework, uh, write to the company, ask them have they done any studies on it. Now you can also ask them for something called a COA, Certificate of Analysis. Does that 100% absolutely uh, give you confidence that it is legit material? Unfortunately, not necessarily, because I've heard of companies just <laughs> fraudulently producing COAs, but do your homework. Most companies in the supplement world that are doing things by the book are going to be more than happy to explain to you what they do, what facilities they manufacture from, uh, what their QC process is, so quality control, how do they test incoming raw material, etc. Because all of those things are expensive and they want to show that they're doing things by the book because they want to sell more products in an ethical way. And like I said, that does cost more money. So if consumers start demanding higher quality product, and that will hopefully drive out some of the shady practices that unfortunately are still going on. So back to NR versus NMN. My bias right now is towards NR because there is more studies on it. Uh, it is easier to verify the raw material via Chromadex. So they do sell a version, uh, which they have not paid me anything to do this podcast or no monetary from them. I did get a couple free samples from them at the current ISSN conference, uh, which was very nice. Uh, but you can find uh, their material online, and that goes under the name uh, Chromadex is the manufacturer. Uh, the consumer-facing name is True Niagen. True is spelled T-R-U. So for NR, that would be my bias in that direction. Again, they do have a license and you will find other companies that are selling it as NR. NMN is a little bit trickier, um, which I think is why it's harder to ensure the raw material is exactly what they say it is. Both of them have some very interesting uh, data in mice and petri dishes and earthworms and other little critters. Um, but NR, as far as I can tell, has more safety data. So in terms of NR, what are you looking at for potential dose? Um, so they did a study. This was, I think, Tramell, uh, T-R-A-M-M-E-L-L. -L. I'll put a link to it here, where they looked at both healthy human volunteers and mice. 
they did a dose of NR at 1,000 milligrams twice per day. So that was 2,000 milligrams or two grams. And they did show that it could increase steady state whole body levels of NAD plus uh, up to about 2.7 fold after one dose. Uh, they did a very nice <clears throat> N of one experiment with uh, lots of sub analysis. Again, I'll link to all of this. And then they also did uh, conducted a controlled experiment with 12 healthy men and women looking at uh, three single doses of NR on blood and urine Na plus metabolites. Uh, that one was published in Nature Communication 2016. Uh, since then, they do have three other studies that did demonstrate uh, NAD plus in terms of increasing it via NR using the <coughs> true niagen product. Doses as high as 2,000 milligrams per day, and the longest study in humans was 12 weeks. So one of the reasons I'm hedging my bets a little bit more towards NR is that they do have, as far as I can tell, more safety data in humans. Because the first question, if you're using any new supplement, is, is it safe, right? So you're looking at the potential upside versus the potential downside. Now, again, you could argue, hey, that's only like really four studies, which in the grand scheme of things is still relatively low, which I would agree with. Um, so we don't have an absolute ton of safety data. NMN, I haven't been able to find as much safety data that's been published. Again, maybe it's out there. Uh, I didn't do a, you know hours and hours of research on it, but it appears NMN has a little bit less data in terms of safety, but I haven't really seen any case reports or haven't seen anything negative that's been published. Again, the question asks if you talk to researchers like David Sinclair, <clears throat> Uh, his bias is that it appears to be safe, um, and again, he has access to, because his lab is studying NMN, much more data that is not going to be currently published yet. So maybe we'll have a lot more data coming, it's just not published yet. In terms of efficacy, we have to segregate between healthy people versus non-healthy people pathologies. A lot of the studies of NR or clinical studies that are going on now are in pathologies. Something's wrong, we're trying to fix it. You will see very different results on that versus does it just increase energy in healthy people? My guess is we'll find that uh, either NMN or NR may be beneficial for uh, different types of pathologies. There's some pretty good underlying data that does support it. But again, there is a general lack of clinical studies in humans. Um, if you look up, there is a whole bunch of clinical studies that are going on right now. Some of the bigger ones, according to the FDA website, should wrap up 2022-2023. So hopefully we will find more safety data and efficacy data <coughs> coming down the line. Uh, so one of them I'm looking for to be published hopefully soon. Uh, I don't know what the status of this. It says the last update was published January 19th, 2022. Effects of vitamin B3 derivatives, nicotinamide, riboside, and NR in bone, skeletal muscle, and metabolic functions in aging. Uh, now this study is a clinical study that's ongoing in uh, healthy elderly uh, individuals. So again, hopefully we will have more information on that coming out. Uh, one side note in terms of uh, dose. Uh, the dosage right now I think is probably relatively low. <clears throat> so if you read online, a lot of it will be, you know, for NR, NMN is going to be different. Um, NR, you know, 300 to 500 milligrams per day. Some of the studies have been looking at 1,000 milligrams per day or even up to 2,000 milligrams per day. Now again, that does potentially get cost prohibitive. Uh, the raw materials on both of them are still quite expensive. In terms of ergogenic data, again, I am waiting for ergogenic data, so data to show that it increases performance. If NAD is a limiter in the energy pathway, then NR or NMN can increase that pathway we would expect that it would show an ergogenic or performance enhancing benefit during exercise. I don't know of any data in humans on either compound that's been published looking at that. I also 
don't know of any athletes that are using it paradoxically. Maybe they're not aware of it, or maybe they've tried it and didn't see any benefit. Who knows? But usually high-level athletes will be trying all sorts of things, whether that's the most healthy thing or not. That's a side question. I haven't anecdotally heard of anyone using it or seeing big benefits. I've heard some anecdotal reports of people using it as an IV, so NAD plus as an IV, and an increase in performance, but I haven't seen even an N of 1 uh, data on that. So again, maybe it was just a perception, maybe they felt better, uh, who knows? So right now, not much data on that. Again, you can look at my podcast from the ISSN. Uh, there was a great talk there, and the presenter was also arguing the same thing that we need more uh, data on NR or NMN to see does it actually increase performance. So if you're a grad student or a PhD student out there or a lab looking for something to do, to me, I think this would be a relatively cool and air quotes easy study to do. Uh, Both compounds are in the sports supplement realm. At least with NR, we've got a fair amount of safety data. So IRB approval shouldn't really be much of an issue. Uh, You could use different uh, methods, like a time trial, to look at does it enhance performance or not in a healthy population. Most of the time, you can get grad students and other healthy college students to be recruited into the study. You could do it as a single dose and then also as an ongoing study. I don't think a single dose is going to do much in terms of exercise performance, but a higher dose over many, many weeks Uh, might. We don't have any data on that. So to sum up, not a ton of data on either one. Uh, I'm hedging my bets a little bit more towards NR because we have more human safety data on it. Again, maybe there is more on NMN. It's just not been published yet or I haven't found it. If you find it, please send it to me. I'll link to a whole bunch of studies here where you can read more up on it. Personally, I'm going to try or I have been trying as it's recording a higher dose of NR using 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams per day. Uh, Right now I'm on week six I just started, and I'll be measuring performance and heart rate and heart rate variability. It'll be an N of one. It's going to not be, quote, unquote, a perfect study, but just seeing does there any effects that I can detect, usual things, measuring sleep by aura, et cetera. Um, So far, I can't say I've noticed any different. Um, The last four days, HRV has been trending up a little bit more. Uh, Again, that could just be from other factors. So it'll be interesting to see at the end of the study. I'm probably going to do it for another six weeks, which will put me right at the 12 weeks, which is where we have human safety data so far. And I'll report via the newsletter if I find anything. So if anyone else has any anecdotal data they want to report, let me know or post up below on social media once this podcast is out. Thank you so much for the question. And to circle back again, in terms of resveratrol, man, I have even less data on that. Again, if you uh, listen to people like Dr. David Sinclair, his argument is that you probably need some Uh, fat for resveratrol to be absorbed. Dosage are probably going to be on the higher side. From what I've determined, just looking at some of the literature, it's really split. Um, So I don't know on that. I haven't played around with it. I've used it for just a couple weeks. Again, didn't notice anything with that. Anecdotal N of 1, probably underdosed and probably for too short of a duration. So There is some theoretical support for it in terms of underlying mechanisms. Um, Will it make a huge uh, difference? I don't know. That's, That's my thought right now. So thank you so much for the question. Really appreciate it. Ask me anything question number two. What was your favorite Slayer segue of all time? This is from Andrew Bailey. So for those who don't know, I did my master's at Michigan Tech University. I actually did two years of postgraduate work there. And then my master's was another two and a half years looking at, primarily it was in the area of biomechanics, was all my coursework. 
And then looking at heat transfer was more of the project that I did. And so while I was there, uh, one of the, the top three reasons I went there was at the time, this is back in the late 90s, which means I'm old, they had one of the top mechanical engineering programs in the U.S., I think in terms of ranking and just total uh, people in the program was top 10, top 5. They had a ski hill, which was great. It's in the UP of Michigan, so the Upper Peninsula Dairy, and they get lots of snow. So I was started snowboarding in 1992. So I did ski patrol for snowboarding there, which was pretty fun. Taught snowboarding lessons for a while. I actually got to teach snowboarding lessons there as, as for gym PE credit. I was one of the instructors for that. That was pretty fun. And then they had a weight room, which was very nice, in the bottom of one of the dormitories that you could sign up for. I think it was like $25 a quarter. And they had a radio station next to it. So a college radio station. You could apply to have your own radio show. So for four <clears throat> plus years, I did a show called Metal Madness on Monday nights from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. And I was also the, for four years, the director of Loud Rock Music there. So I was in charge of uh, talking to all the record labels, getting CDs in at that time, which tells you about how old it was, uh, keeping track of the music that was played, charting, etc. Now, one of the things I did on the radio show was I would have whatever like was one of the more poppy type songs uh, in the middle of a block of metal I would just start playing that and then I would fade Slayer into it <laughs> which I stole that from a previous DJ who I, I can't even remember right now so I'd say probably my favorite of all time was Britney Spears was super popular at that time so I I think that was one of my favorite ones. Uh, side note on that, which was very interesting, we used to drive down to the Twin Cities, especially First Avenue, for a lot of metal shows. The drive would be seven and a half hours, uh, typically. Uh, I remember we drove down once to see uh, Cradle of Filth, which was awesome. Got to meet Danny, the bass player. I'd met him a couple of years earlier at the old Milwaukee Metal Fest. And so he was doing his impersonation of uh, Britney Spears during the warm-up uh, before they went on stage because she was playing that night literally across the street at the Target Center. So to hear his voice do impersonations of Britney Spears was pretty interesting to say the least. So that was probably one of my uh, favorite ones of all time. Uh, I, I do miss doing the radio show. I've thought about doing it as a podcast again for many years. Downside is I can't figure out how you get around copyright issues, even if you have all the music per se. Uh, most platforms right now are very strict on it, but yet I know people have put out stuff on YouTube and that seems to be okay. So I don't know. If anyone has any ideas of how to get around that, let me know. Yeah, not looking to steal any artist's material or anything, but just trying to uh, help them out and uh, distribute more cool music to people. So thank you so much for the question. Next question here on the Ask Me Anything is from Nate Had. <clears throat> How can I increase my HRV? Any suggestions on supplements, <clears throat> lifestyle changes, types of exercise? Any insight would be great. Cool. So HRV as a overview for people who may not be familiar with it, HRV is equal to heart rate variability. If your heart rate is beating like a metronome, so right on the beat all the time, that's actually not a good thing. There should be some fine scale variability in your heart rate when measured at rest. So if I was to record your heart rate at rest when you're listening to this, Let's say it's 69.7, 71.2, 70.3, 69.7, 71.2. It's going to oscillate a little bit around an average point. So the more of this fine scale oscillation or fine scale variability, the more heart rate variability you have. And in general, that's considered a good thing. That's actually a marker for para 
sympathetic tone. So heart rate variability is a way to monitor the level of stress via the status of your autonomic nervous system. So your autonomic nervous system is composed of two components. One is the parasympathetic side. This is like the brake on your car. As you push harder on the brake, you increase something called vagal tone. Heart rate goes down, right? So you're stepping on the brake of the car. The car is going to slow down. Uh, this increases what's called parasympathetic tone. I'm increasing how hard I'm pressing on the brake. Therefore, the car is slowing down. So a higher parasympathetic tone will result in a lower heart rate. The other side is the sympathetic side. This is like pressing down on the gas pedal of the car. As I lose fine scale variability, my heart becomes more like a metronome, I'm increasing sympathetic tone. So I am pressing down harder on the gas pedal and heart rate will then go up. So if you measure the status of your heart rate variability, I've been doing this in clients now for, oh man, <clears throat> going on eight years, I think, uh, pretty much since the iThlete app came out. So instead of athlete, it's iThlete with an I. So that is the app I still use uh, to this day to measure it. There's some good studies to support it. Uh, Simon, the CEO, is a good buddy. And the nice part is that you can measure it now daily. So one-off measurement, probably not that useful, but if you've got a trend over a couple weeks, very useful. That's telling you how much stress your nervous system is under. Side note on that, with the iFleet system, you wanna take a measurement once in the morning. For most people, this is gonna be in a seated position. And then below that, you can enter in different contexts. So self-report of, energy, uh, exercise intensity, <clears throat> sleep, etc. The nice part then is I have a measure of resting heart rate because we'll get that from the app also. I have a measure of heart rate variability, which takes about 60 seconds. So I know the status of their nervous system, how stressed they are. And I also have the context indicators to just kind of get an idea of what's going on with that particular client or athlete. So I find heart rate variability to be super useful. Again, I'm biased because my research uh, that I did for my PhD was in metabolic flexibility and also heart rate variability. So back in the day, we measured it via coming into the lab. We had some used equipment that cost us several thousand dollars. And I actually had to write a silly MATLAB program to transcribe it, enter it in by hand and do a, a finished program called Kubios, which is open access. And it was a real big pain in the butt. You just had to come into the lab in order to get the measurements. Um, now they're sticking HRV into like every device known to man. I would make sure that what you're looking at for HRV is a valid measurement. I just got another question on this this morning. Um, so write to the company, see what validation data they have on it because HRV is becoming more sexy now and there's some good ways to measure it, but I don't really trust it in a lot of consumer devices yet. I know they'll probably get better over time, but caveat, watch out. So back to the question from Nate, any suggestions on supplements, lifestyle, and types of exercise would be great. So I'll categorize these in to supplement, lifestyle changes, and types of exercise. Number one on the list would be increasing your aerobic base. I'll probably have another question in the AMA series at some point about aerobic training too. But aerobic training is your metabolism's way of using oxygen to create energy. Commonly in the lab or there's other markers you can do to measure this, it's something called VO2 max. So VO2, the volume of oxygen, a maximal rate your body can use. If we put you on a rover or a treadmill or a bike, and we use something called a metabolic cart that can measure how much air is coming in and air is going out. And it's looking at oxygen and CO2 levels during exercise. When we see that despite increasing exercise intensity, <clears throat> your body will reach a plateau of maximal oxygen use. So this by definition then 
is your VO2 max. So for aerobic athletes, endurance athletes, this is sort of the equivalent to their one rep max for a strength athlete. VO2 max is not the be all end all for prediction of endurance athletes, but it is one of the factors and is the best way <coughs> to measure your aerobic base. Now, if you're not a complete uh, nerd like I am, I actually have a metabolic cart here. Uh, shout out to the PNOE people. If you have any questions on that, you can email me. I also have a Moxie setup, which lets you look at muscle oxygenation levels at little local level also. So we'll stick them on their quads or the working muscle. So I can see systemic changes in flow rates, how much air is going in and out, changes in oxygen, changes in carbon dioxide. And I can also look at on a muscle level, how much oxygen is being used at that particular local level. Again, you probably don't need all of that. It's pretty expensive. It's several thousand dollars. You can do a 2000 meter test on a Concept2 rower. So go to the Concept2 site, just type in VO2 max calculator Concept2, it'll pop up. When you get to your Concept2 rower, set it for exactly 2000 meters and row as hard as you can. It will not be much fun at all. It will definitely suck, but then you can plug in that time into the online calculator and it'll give you a rough estimate of your VO2 max. Um, I've done some stuff comparing that with uh, Metabolic Heart on a few clients and myself, and they have published data on it also. It's referenced on their site, and it does appear to be relatively accurate. Now, again, it's an equation, so it's not going to be as accurate as using a Metabolic Heart, but if you don't have any fancy $1,000 in equipment, it's a pretty good starting point. So if you want to know what your aerobic base is, that's one way to do it. Uh, the other way is a 12-minute Cooper run test. Find a relatively flat area, warm up, see how far you can run in exactly 12 minutes. Uh, that'll give you an idea of your VO2 max. Also, you can find an equation online. Just type in 12-minute Cooper run test into your favorite <coughs> search engine, and you'll be able to figure that out. Now, again, because the economy is different, your movement patterns, rowing versus running, you may get two different numbers. All things being equal, if you're primarily doing running, training for a marathon, half marathon, 5K, Cooper run test is gonna be a little bit more specific. If you're more of a strength and power or recreational athlete, you don't do a lot of aerobic training, my bias is to use the 2K uh, just because the mechanics are gonna be a little bit better on your body. You don't have a lot of eccentric loading from running. You don't have to worry as much about running mechanics, it's gonna be a little bit safer. So my bias there is use the 2K on the rower. If you are in the very bottom percentage of VO2 max compared to a general population, there'll be various charts you can find for this data pretty easily. Yep, doing some aerobic training is gonna probably increase your heart rate variability. How that works is that the baseline energy system you're using, if you're just hanging out listening to this podcast, doing a walk, doing your dishes, driving, all of that is supported by aerobic metabolism. If your engine for that is really tiny, you're walking around kind of redlining yourself all the time, so your stress is going to be higher. If you have a much bigger engine, i.e. your VO2 max, your aerobic engine is a lot bigger, you're using a much smaller percentage of it all of the time. If I have a V12 engine, I don't need to rev the RPM super high to go fast. If I've got a little complacent, you know, lawnmower engine with a squirrel and a roller skate, then yes, I need to go to a higher percentage of that in order to get the same level of performance. So VO2 max is a way to measure that. Do some type of aerobic training to increase it if it's very low. You will see a transfer to heart rate variability in almost all cases. So that would be number one. Uh, number two, we'll say lifestyle changes is going to be sleep. Again, this is not taking into account the psychological, um, I would say, habit change associated with that. right? So if I could wave my magic wand and get everyone to sleep an extra one to three hours a night, that would be amazing. However, as a habit change, that can be much harder for people. 
things you can do to increase quality of sleep. I talk about sleep in the Flex Diet Cert. I talk about exercise there too. Uh, for aerobic exercise, I go in more depth than that in the Fizz Flex certification. But sleep is going to be number one for lifestyle changes. I would say number two would be better breathing. If you can increase your economy or efficiency of breathing, that's going to be much, much better. So I'm a fan when you're doing your aerobic training to do it via nasal breathing, not mouth breathing. It's submax. So you don't need to breathe out of your mouth. <clears throat> and you can train yourself to do more nasal breathing. There is data to support that nasal breathing is more parasympathetic than mouth breathing. So lifestyle changes, sleep would be number one. Breathing mechanics and efficiency, economy would be number two. Uh, if you can work with someone who can help you with that in person, that's helpful. Uh, I like doing RPR, reflexive performance reset, or be activated training. I find that that makes a big difference. It's generally not a lot of fun. Most people's rib cages are really, really restricted. You should have, in a perfect world, expansion of the rib cage in the front, back, and the sides. So that when your diaphragm is working better, you're getting more expansion. So you're becoming more efficient. Um, just by doing that, I've done some experiments here where persons come in for an RPR session. We've spent, oh man, sometimes an hour, hour and a half just working on uh, rib cage stuff, diaphragm activation, etc. I even throw in some bastardized like PRI type exercises in there, Postural Restoration Institute. So shout out to Ron Horaska. And many times the next day, the HRV will be substantially better. Not in all cases, but in a lot of cases. So that would be for lifestyle changes. In terms of supplements, it really depends on where you're at. You know, obviously, you know, food, nutrition is going to be number one. I think an area there that people miss, and I know I missed it for many years, is are you providing enough caloric intake to support your exercise? If you are not, and you are purposely in a fat loss phase, then that makes sense, right? You have to be in a caloric deficit. However, if you are not, and you are being lower in calories, I find that that is a stressor for most people on their system, and their heart rate variability will be more on the sympathetic side, right? Because trying to have the exact same output of your body or close to it in a caloric deficit is a stressor itself. Again, this is more like a dial, not a switch. The bigger caloric deficit that you have, it's going to be a higher stressor. So that'd be number one. Number two, there is some data to support fruit and vegetable intake on heart rate variability. And this makes sense in terms of micronutrients. You want to have sufficient supply of micronutrients. In some cases, I have used a uh, multivitamin. I'll place a link down below to the one that, that I use, which I am an affiliate for. Uh, but they do have lots of uh, published data on the finished product. If that's all in intact and you're doing good, next I would say would be a fish oil supplement. Uh, for online clients and for people, I do use an at-home test <clears throat> where you prick your finger, bleed on some paper, uh, send it in. And you can look at your omega-3 status. I'll place a link to a podcast I did with Dr. Doug all about that. Or if that's something you want to do, you can contact me. We can do it through the mail. Uh, they'll send you the results and they'll just uh, give you my interpretation of them. You generally need to go relatively high, but this all depends on how deficient you are. Right? So that's why it's hard to give like a flat recommendation for amount of fish oil. Right? So fish oil is EPA plus DHA. These are the essential fatty acids. Most people are probably going to need to consume 2 to 4 grams of combined EPA and DHA per day, according to most of the research. And that's the assumption that <clears throat> people are on the lower side and that they're not consuming a lot of uh, cold water fish. So fish oil would be my number one in there. Uh, obviously having sufficient calories and a micronutrition would also be in there. Lifestyle would be sleep and breathing mechanics. Exercise would be some type of aerobic training. Those would be the top interventions I would have to increase heart rate variability. And then a side note, 
If you wanna go beyond that, so you're doing good, you've got all of those in check. Again, my bias would be looking at things that do homeostatic regulation in the body. So this is the basis of the physiologic flexibility cert. You can go to physiologicflexibility.com for all the information. But the four systems there, number one is gonna be temperature. So doing some controlled exposure to cold and heat. I've seen increases in heart rate variability over the long term. You can also use it to acutely measure if you overstepped a little bit. Because remember that those are all acute stressors. But long term, once your body is building up more kind of physiologic headroom in those areas, I do find that HRV generally gets better. And by better, we're meaning a little bit more on the parasympathetic side so that you are better capacity to buffer stressors. Uh, the second one in the homeostatic regulators in the PhysFlex cert, uh, this would be looking at pH, right? So you can increase and sort of literally dump more acid into the body by doing high intensity exercise, some breathing techniques. Uh, you can also do things to make the body more basic. Uh, and this is not all the weird detox, like eat basic food and alkaline diet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, breathing techniques, yes, nutrition is involved in that too. Number three would be more on the metabolic flexibility side. How well can your body use carbohydrates? How well can it use fat? So expanding out the energy and the fuel systems that you're using on both ends of the spectrum. And number four would be the use of oxygen and carbon dioxide. You can do different things to purposely increase the buildup of carbon dioxide, such as high intensity exercise, the breathing techniques, and you can do things to also expel more carbon dioxide. And what you'll notice is all these things are also interrelated to each other. For example, if I am doing a, a super ventilation method, kind of like a fast in and out breathing technique, a la like a Wim Hof or a Tumo breathing, I'm breathing out really fast. I'm also breathing in a little bit more deep. And because my respiratory rate is very high, I'm expelling more carbon dioxide. And when I expel more carbon dioxide, I'm removing a acid from the body. So CO2 uh, forms something with water called carbonic acid. And I'm literally temporarily making the blood a little bit more basic at that point. So again, all of these techniques kind of overlap each other. So the big takeaway here is once you've got the basics uh, down, that's primarily the basis of the flex diet cert, then you wanna increase your resilience, your robustness, your anti-fragility, which is can be measured by your chronic level of heart rate variability. My bias there would be looking at the four homeostatic regulators and that system would be the physiologic flexibility system. And thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed this installment of the Ask Me Anything series brought to you by Flex Diet Certification. Go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T dot com for all the information there. If you're looking for a complete system to maximize your ability to recover primarily via nutrition but we cover everything from protein to fats carbohydrates neat such as walking exercise sleep micronutrition and much more this is all designed to increase your body's ability to recover if you're training to add lean body mass performance and do it all in a flexible approach without destroying your health in the process so go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com, and there'll be a notice there to get on to the newsletter for the wait list. I'll also be sending you lots of great information there via the newsletter. Most of my content now actually goes out to the newsletter. So you can go there, flexdiet.com. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. As always, if you would place a review below whatever podcast you're using, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, etc. 
really helps the program and allows us to get uh, more interviews with other people and keep bringing you great content. So any feedback you would like to see, uh, also please drop me a note. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Talk to you again next week. That was a great number. I don't care what you say. I thought it was dumb. Maybe you're right. <laughs>